uh, uh, get the aerial extent of glacier. We have but discussed um, about how to estimate the uh, spatial distribution of depth and convert that spatial distribution into the volume. So that aspect probably we have uh, looked into that. Um, so uh, what is um, another important aspect in this is uh, we have discussed uh, quite a lot in this my our previous talk about how the influence of uh, uh, Western disturbances and the influence of Indian monsoon uh, is is affecting the um, uh, is affecting the accumulation of snow into the glacier, particularly in Western Himalaya. It is predominantly coming from west uh, westerlies and coming in the winter time. And Eastern Himalaya, it is predominantly coming from uh, uh, Indian Indian summer monsoon. So these are the uh, these are the uh, uh, fundamental uh, um, aspects of uh, origin of source. Uh, we already uh, discussed this slide where we have said how much is the glacial store water in. Indus River, how much is in Ganga River, and how much is the Brahmaputra River. So, uh, important point is this uh, Ganga uh, Indus River uh, has a maximum amount of. Uh, oh no, I think it is something is troubling me all the time. Is there. Uh, well, Who said slide, slide is visible? Slide all the time. Okay. Okay, uh, all right. So we have this Indus River, which which has the maximum amount of uh, glacial uh, terrain, which is and glacial store water, which is approximately uh, a two thousand uh, cubic kilometer. Then it is in Brahmaputra, which is around nine hundred cubic kilometer, and then it is around six hundred cubic kilometer in Ganga River Basin. Uh, we have also uh, seen that how uh, temperature uh, is changing in Himalayas and uh, particularly as compared to the Indian Himalayas because as compared to the India. So when India was cooler, the mountain was much cooler. So you can see here all over India, all over India, this is how uh, here, but <clears throat> uh, particularly in 1950s, 60s and 70s, uh, as compared to as of now, uh, the Indian subcontinent was much cooler, uh, but M Himalayan mountain was much cooler than Indian subcontinent. That is the issue uh, you should understand. And if you come to the warm phase, we started into the 80s and 90s. You can see that uh, as compared to the Indian subcontinent, uh, the Himalayan region is much warmer, clearly suggesting that either it is in cooling phase or warming phase, there is a uh, there's a there's a significant amount of higher uh, higher cooling or higher uh, rise in temperature in Himalaya is concerned. So many times we talk about the two degree rise in the global temperature. It probably means three degree rise temperature in Himalaya. So that aspect has to be really understood. And we know that this is a Pindari glacier which has significantly lost its uh, lost its area. And we already know that. Uh, some regions of Brahmaputra River uh, uh, or basins in Bantraputra are reducing approximately uh, 14 meters per year around the same uh, range. It is um, uh, reducing its length uh, 15, 16 kilometer and then, but it is significantly reduced more uh, into the uh, Karakoram Highway, uh, Karakoram uh, mountain range. So you can see here the Karakoram region, there is only um, marginal decrease in glacial length takes place as compared to the central Himalayas uh, or as compared to the eastern Himalayas. So what are the potential reasons for that? That is very important for us to understand. And the Karakoram, and that is generally called as a Karakoram anomaly. Uh, there are numerous theories. It is it's like uh, Karakoram anomaly is like a Bermuda Triangle, you know, uh, many people have a 
many theories on that why some are saying uh, something related to the atmospheric phenomena some are saying something else but if we know the previous slides uh, over here then we can see that uh, Karakoram mountain range much higher uh, as compared to the great Himalayan mountain range or uh, as compared to the uh, other mountain ranges into the Himalayas. Um, but same time we know that as we go higher into the atmosphere uh, the temperature rise and global warming is higher uh, and uh, if that is the so then what is causing uh, Karakoram glaciers not to uh, not to significantly uh, retreat as compared to the central Himalayan glaciers or uh, western Himalayan glaciers, uh, western Himalayan glaciers that matter or that matter in uh, eastern Himalayan glaciers. So um, uh, we here in uh, the Vecha Center has carried out extensive work to understand what really happens and you can see that idea about which we talked yesterday or a couple of days back during mass balance study is the equilibrium line altitude. So, yeah, so equilibrium line altitude um, is an important indicator and you can see that since the glaciers are located very large altitude uh, as compared to the uh, other parts of Himalaya, uh, there is a substantial amount of uh, land which is above the equilibrium line and making these glaciers have relatively less loss in mass. So this can one be explained by using equilibrium line and it suggests that as of now glaciers are very close to the uh, equilibrium that means they are very close to zero mass balance. Uh, so it is precariously uh, stage as of now, but don't expect that this anomaly will remain anomaly for another 20, 50, 25 years. So it is quite possible in future this anomaly will vanish and glaciers will also start retreating, uh, if not the same rate as, as the, at the central or eastern Himalaya, if there, there, there are glaciers remains there, uh, but definitely it will start retreating much higher. So let us come back to the area of investigation which we are talking about, the Uttarakhand. So uh, we have carried out detailed investigation in Uttarakhand to understand. So this is uh, how many glaciers are there. You can really download the products um, uh, or the layer which is available from different sources starting from AC mode to um, RGI glacial inventory or there are so many other inventories are there and you can see that approximately 1400 or 50 glaciers are in Uttarakhand and total area is approximately 2,148 square kilometer and it is varying from 3,000 to 7,000 meters so 7,800 meters so we have this river, which is, uh, this is a Gangotri glacier, and you have, um, and then another side of Gangotri glacier, you have Satopan glaciers, uh, series of glaciers, and then you have, this is Alaknanda river, and you have Hagiriti river. Uh, so, uh, so this is a total glacial store water into the glacier, glacier distribution into the Uttarakhand. And out of, uh, and if you apply model, uh, we generally we apply here model based upon laminar flow method. And then uh, for some glaciers, we are not able to get the laminar flow, uh, apply laminar flow method, possibly because of the uh, cloud cover, because of inability to get the velocity. If size is too small, sometimes, or they are excessively debris cover. Under such circumstances, you may not be able to get the descent uh, velocity, then you cannot apply the laminar flow method. So under such circumstances, we try to apply the uh, scaling method. So first you develop or uh, use the laminar flow method. And from that result, you get 
uh, you develop the scaling equation and the scaling equation then apply to the remaining glacier so we get the uh, um, we get for entire uh, region how much is the glacier store water so as of now a glacial store water is 117 um, uh, gigaton uh, so uh, you have cubic kilometer multiplied by density and you can you can get into tons or you can get into the gigaton uh, in addition to that we have also applied for entire mountain range the uh, the method which is called improved accumulation area ratio method. You people have worked on it, probably you have done the one exercise on that. So you can see that from 2000, uh, 2000 to, uh, from year 2000 to 2013, for 13 years, how much is loss in uh, total volume of water. So it is almost a seven gigaton is lost and we have as of now approximately 117 gigaton of water. So some of you may think there's a plenty of water into the glaciers, but it is also important for us to understand its spatial distribution. Some glaciers, which are located um, very high altitude, sometimes show the positive mass balance. You can say they are located in very high altitude, but some glaciers, uh, many glaciers which are located in a low altitude are showing a significantly negative mass balance, indicating that um, uh, regions are, are much more vulnerable. And remember, sometimes very large glaciers are very close to positive mass balance or um, are they not losing as high as you expect, but uh, because of their volume, they continue to sustain uh, it's uh, if not the dimension in present form, but at least in some form. Um, uh, but communities are not living around such big glaciers. And because of that, uh, most of the small glaciers are vulnerable and communities are. So let us look into the Rushiganga Valley. So what happens in uh, Rushiganga Valley? Because this is the region where this flash flood was originated. Uh, in Uttarakhand. So you can see that this is a uh, Rushiganga basin and which you have numerous um, glaciers. You have Ramni Glacier, then you have this uh, Nanda Devi, Uttar Nanda Devi Glaciers, you have Southern Nanda Devi Glaciers, then you have a Trishul, which is one of the famous peak, you have Trishul Glacier. But this event has particularly happened around the around the Ronat Glacier, and this is the location where this flash flood has taken place, and it has moved down all along the river, Rushiganga River, and then eventually it met into the Dhauliganga River Basin, or the Dhauliganga River Stream. Uh, so that is how it has happened. So it is also important for us, we thought, to understand, um, uh, to realize how much is glacial store water in this basin. So there are six major basins we have worked on it. And this is, you can see that this is a north, uh, this is the first glacier, which is a north Nanda Devi glacier, which has largest glacial store water. And it is given uh, in our 0.5, slightly less. And then um, uh, three, which is a Rishi, uh, Rishi, it has much higher also. So Trishul also is one of the major glaciers. It has very high, uh, fairly high amount of uh, glacial store uh, of water and sixth is uh, round thick glacier and you can see along in this there's approximately 0.85 cubic kilometer of water was uh, is stored in this glacier so what is really uh, we should realize what has happened on that day that when the flash flood has taken place it has uh, this you can see satellite picture is of rishiganga hydropower plant and you can see here that there are nice um, uh, there are nice pictures, but there are hydropower plants, uh, their locations, everything can see. And when the flash flood has gone, uh, this is a direction of flow. And you can see that this uh, completely sedimented now, either eroded and sediment has uh, really deposited. And uh, this, this, hydro, uh, this power plant is completely destroyed. Similarly, the story in a Tapovan, which is a 
Vishnugad hydropower plant, which is a certain, uh, uh, it, we, this particular power plant in Thauliganga river basin, but but um, immediately after the confluence of Rishiganga and Thauliganga river. So you can see here that uh, this is the before, um, uh, uh, before and after you can say there's a complete sediment deposition on this and this entire power plant is a significantly destroyed uh, because of the deposition of the um, deposition of the sediments on it. So clearly affecting, uh, we know that a lot of people have also got killed, uh, died during this flash flood and there's an enormous loss to the human life as well as there's a loss to the uh, human property. So it is important for us to understand what is really happening. So let us look uh, into the into the idea issue that where this particular has started. So this is a Ronald Glacier about which we talk about. And this is the region where this uh, ice avalanches had taken place. Um, and you can see that uh, how much is, uh, this is a, a satellite imagery. This was taken earlier uh, than the incident has happened. And this is another satellite imagery which is after the incident has occurred. So you can see here one thing, the upper reaches has a 5,500 meter is elevation and lower reaches has approximately, you can see here, is approximately 4,500 meters. So it is really um, one kilometer of altitude, uh, which has really um, uh, that much, uh, area has really uh, moved uh, into the downstream. Uh, and top of that, how much is also, this is very, uh, you can see that it is a 550 meter by width. So uh, the width on top is approximately 550 meter and length is approximately a kilometer. Kilometer, uh, uh, height is a kilometer. So length may be higher than that. So height is a kilometer. So this is a huge amount of uh, ice along with large debris um, has moved down and creating, uh, you can see here that this is uh, how uh, in 3D, you can see this picture over here, it has moved down and you can see this is, a, uh, this is the imagery which is taken before the incident and you can see huge amount of Mm, ice uh, was there. So uh, since uh, you know that uh, we have now, now this much is, um, this is how the path has taken place. So uh, this is fallen from here and this has flown along this thing and it has moved downstream along the Rishiganga Valley, uh, Rishiganga stream. But uh, remember, glacier ends here. Hmm. So actually the path of or the flow is not on the glacier, but this is on the, uh, you can see this is still deglaciated valley. So this, this is still on the, uh, on the land, a land which was earlier vacated by glacier, which is normally we call deglaciated valley. So this is a part of deglaciated valley, but not necessarily this has fallen on the, uh, main glacier body, it is still a little bit uh, uh, behind. You can see that uh, when it was flowing uh, downstream, it is created a huge dust storm. Um, you can see that there's a significant amount of dust storm is taken and probably it has moved downstream. If you look into the satellite picture earlier, you can see that there's a certain amount of snow which is here but not necessarily this snow is very deep uh, except also except along this uh, along this stream if there are some avalanches have taken place and there's accumulation of so but predominantly you can see here this is the patchy snow but as this uh, uh, as this avalanche moved down the valley it has created dust storm and that dust is now deposited onto the snow. So uh, sometimes you can see this also moves like this 
and it is actually partly deposited on the it is also partly deposited on the terminus region of the glacier so uh, so uh, there was a lot of theories was floated after that people thought that uh, that that there might be uh, various reasons and uh, uh, because of it uh, so you can see that this is how the dust deposition is snow and this is the path of um, uh, its movement of uh, of this uh, flash flood had moved from there uh, in that region. That region is also, uh, this is a satellite picture which suggests that there is a huge, uh, some amount of precipitation has taken place. Uh, it could be as high as around some regions could be as, as high as uh, 50 millimeters. Uh, something like that, or it is in centimeter, I don't know, a uh, millimeter, it is in millimeter, uh, so around 50 millimeter is showing. Uh, so it is a snowfall. Uh, this is not a, not a, not a, not a, pre a precipitation in form of liquid, but this is a precipitation in form of snow. But this is still needs to be verified on the ground, essentially because there are other reports which is coming from AGU, suggests that there was not much precipitation in this region. So some satellites are showing no precipitation. Some satellites are showing very moderate precipitation. Therefore, we need to understand on the basis of the data, which is locally available, to see how much precipitation has taken place on that day. Uh, it is also important for us to understand how much is, um, how much is the amount of uh, ice or rock has moved down the valley. We know one thing that it is a one kilometer of uh, uh, ice wall has moved. Its width was approximately 500 meters and its, uh, it's a vertical, you know, a vertical length was around um, uh, much uh, around. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, there was estimates based upon uh, certain uh, uh, certain ideas. So what is really you do is in this particular case, they have used the uh, multiple uh, uh, digital elevation model. So digital elevation model, which is taken in 2013 and 2021 after that is used to estimate how much is actually there's a depression, and idea is that much ice might have moved. So 2013, there was a water, there was a glacier, and after that, this is incident. So some places, it is high, high, as high as 150 meters. So this is this region where 150 meters deep mm, scar has taken place. That means um, uh, this is this is quite substantial depth, you know. Uh, and unless there is something significantly happened there, it is very difficult to say that how deep um, uh, this has taken place. So total volume has come approximately 25 million cubic kilometer in this region. So uh, we try to apply our model to understand how much is um, uh, there is a ice in it that now we know that 25 million uh, cubic kilometer is a is a volume which has moved down that out of that how much is a is a ice so in order to do that first thing you have done this exercise where you can estimate the velocity of glacier so first thing we try to do is to estimate the velocity of glacier uh, so this is a hanging glacier and this was never tried. This idea was never tried on the hanging glacier because, because it has very steep slope. Um, and I think this has around, around uh, 30, 35 um, degree slope. We, we will know that. Uh, I think next slide probably has 38 degree slope. So it is very large uh, slope. It is there. So you can see that at some places, glaciers are moving faster and at some places, glaciers are losing, moving slowly. Nothing erroneous in it. 
uh, and nothing unusual in it. Uh, essentially, because in certain region, wherever there is a glaciers move fast, and certain region, at, as you come towards the terminus, the velocity of glaciers uh, significantly retards. So this is something which is not, there's no anomaly in it. But anomaly is lies somewhere else. So you can see here this anomaly that that means in the higher reaches, there's a very little snow thickness. That means uh, ice thickness, so it is less. Um, and you can see it is around 10 to 20 meter thick. But as you come towards the bottom, uh, it has very large, around uh, higher than 40 meter is the ice thickness. That is very unusual. That is not generally you can expect into the glaciers. And out of that 25, this volume is around 6.86 million cubic kilometers. So ice volume in this entire mass, there could be much, some other glaciers might have moved along with that, but it can't be more than uh, something which will follow along this. So around eight to nine million uh, maximums, this is around seven million cubic meter out of 25 uh, is, uh, is the ice mass. So another key, point which you should understand is near the this we are talk, uh, talking about 1200 meters 121300 meters is the total length and you can see here that there is a maximum concentration of ice at the bottom at the bottom which is here clearly suggested that the gl glacial ice has significantly moved the down um, and that has created some sort of and because of its steep slope uh, 38 degree slope, it has really created an anomaly uh, into this um, into into this hanging glaciers. Uh, we also try to understand how uh, how much is a, how much is a, uh, water uh, can come uh, under normal circumstances in that. That means if uh, if it is a precipitation and temperature, uh, uh, we know that we have taken meteorological data from Bhujbasa, which is in uh, adjacent basin, but quickly we wanted to do it. And we run this model, WIP model to understand how much. And you can see very interesting results that in a, in a February, if we really want to know, the it can have very little amount of of water in it. That means six meter cube per second. That is small volume. And that is the volume at the confluence of uh, uh, or near the Rushiganga hydropower plant. If you move to the glaciated terrain like here, um, like here or here, there is hardly any pre uh, stream runoff will take place because at that altitude snow is not melting. Snow is predominantly melting in a lower altitude and contributing small amount of water uh, into the stream. In addition to that, there will be some contribution from groundwater as well. And probably this is, you can see here that, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, we are in February. So you can see here in February, there's a, some amount is base flow, certain amount is coming from uh, uh, rain and some amount is coming from uh, coming from snow melt. Uh, uh, so still it is very low. So it is important for us to understand this uh, significant amount of water which has come into the flash flood is probably not caused because of this snow melt or because of the glacier melt. It has predominantly caused because of something else. And something else is a combination of um, ice, uh, ice and land. Uh, land. So, uh, so it is really um, uh, intriguing for anyone. If you really look into that, is we have a, not only the large mass of ice has moved, uh, so you can see that if we are talking about the 150 meter total depth here, uh, if we are talking here about 150 meter total depth of scar, out of that only 
40 meters uh, are in this region, it is only coming about 10 to around 20 meters, 10 to 20 meters, uh, maybe some places 30 meters, is coming from uh, out of 150 from glaciers, this loss in thickness. That means around 140 meter rock, 120 meter rock has really moved down. That is a huge amount of, so there has to be, uh, as suggested by many others, there has to be some uh, uh, very unique phenomena which might have started quite earlier and where a deep amount of some sort of uh, tectonic uh, feature uh, activity might have initiated this car and eventually there's a complete uh, uh, failure of um, a large uh, rock mass has taken place, the entire, uh, entire uh, part of the uh, mountain slope has completely slipped down along with, uh, along with the ice. So this is where, but it is not necessary when such kind of tragedy happens, uh, there could be additional issues can happen in that region. And one of the such issues is a formation of lake. That what it means is, if you look into this, uh, some of this picture, when it is a huge, no, it's far up. So when it is a huge amount of uh, rock and water moves, uh, it deposits significant amount of debris on its sides, and it can block this small stream which is coming down. And this particular case, the small stream is blocked and creating a lake. It is important because there's already people have gone there and studied it and find out how much is the depth of that lake and how much is um, how much is um, water stored in it and if it is there, how much flash flood it will cause. So it is very very important for us to uh, to understand uh, that there could be additional source of now uh, risk for the people living in the downstream. Uh, because as snow melt season starts now, uh, more and more snow, uh, snow starts melting, it is quite possible now, new lakes will be formed and some of them could be small and they can, uh, the, it may not cause much flood, but if there's a big lake form, uh, this could be a disaster. That means we required a constant monitoring of this region um, to ensure that we are uh, we are not caught napping in in this problem uh, it is also for us to understand is this is very unique case what has happened uh, last month in uttarakhand uh, where uh, where there is a significant amount of rock and debris and ice and moon but there are other potential source of you know, risk into the uh, into the Himalaya. Yesterday, you have seen in this picture, and you can see that in Alakranda, we seen there are large number of lakes are already there. So you have large number of uh, lakes which are already existing uh, in this region, and they can potentially cause flash flood downstream. So and there are large hydropower stations are there. Um, uh, you can see these all operational hydropower stations are there. So it is important for us to now understand what is this, uh, why, what are the risks associated with these lakes. So this is very, and this is one work which is done by Asim, our doctoral student. Uh, we are just, com uh, we have completed doctorate last year and um, uh, he has done uh, brilliant work to understand this is one of the lake and how we have discussed this issue quite in depth uh, yesterday uh, about the uh, uh, potential. So it is now possible, suppose for example, if this lake is formed and if we know its volume, we can now by using this modeling techniques which we have with us, we can really predict whether this will cause a significant flash flood downstream or not. So what we require that we have a significant development and advances in the science. Now we need to operationalize that science. Um, 
for uh, policy decisions or are taken so real time policy decision so that means somebody has to work uh, in close proximity of people who are managing those things on the ground and tell them okay this leg may not affect this leg may affect all those things are there so uh, there is the advancement in science so whether there will be of course we have seen this side that there will be more and more uh, new lakes will be formed into the glacier, into the Himalaya. As glaciers start retreating, you can be assured yourself that there will be a large number of uh, new lakes will be formed into the Himalayas, and some of and they can be outburst by numerous reasons. We have looked into this um, yesterday. Uh, there could be cloud burst, whether it could be uh, ice avalanches, it could be landslide, it could be moraines, or it could be um, um, uh, what you call it, earthquake. So whatever may be the cause, um, we have to prepare ourselves uh, to ensure that uh, we face this uh, new risk in a such a fashion that uh, we are not putting our uh, uh, human life and property is at the risk. So uh, there will be that, and we have now this him tool tool, which I have shown you this slide. I'm sure you will do later on the exercise on this. So when it comes to the Alaknanda and Bhagirathi river, this is also an interesting study. It is we have already seen some lakes, but it has a potential to form a large number of lakes in future. So this is our model tells us that in future you are going to have a large number of lakes in this region. So you can see. So what is this is all about? This is all about is you require a robust program to monitor this region all the time, where new lakes will form, whether they are sufficiently large enough, risk the uh, risk the human settlement downstream. How we can reduce the risk? Uh, how can we mitigate that risk? All those things has to be really addressed. Uh, and it is not only Uttarakhand. I can assure you that all other parts of Himalaya, such as Himachal Pradesh, or or uh, whether you go to the uh, Kashmir, or whether you go to the Jammu region, or whether you go to um, go to the Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, wherever you go. They all are going to have this, and now we have a tools by which not only today we can also predict how they are going to expand in future. So all these issues now we need to bring at one place to create a management uh, management strategy to manage. So it is also important because I have given this particular thought to it because this is a question often asked to me that whether this tragedy, tragedy is caused because of the uh, human interference. Um, I think we have to be very sensitive to this question as well as realize that some of the changes we are doing into the environment is definitely caused by, uh, caused by the uh, human beings. Like uh, if you talk about the climate change, which is a definitely climate change is caused because of the human interference. We also, uh, uh, some of those ideas that, um, uh, because people were talking about that freeze and thaw metamorphism and the permafrost. So uh, this can cause this, this huge landslide, but I feel this is very unlikely because uh, the work which is carried out mostly in Alps um, and Rockies suggests that such kind of uh, landfall, when it takes because of the permafrost and freeze and thaw cycle, this could be around uh, 10 to 15 um, uh, meters. It may not be very deep in size. You also have to realize one thing in 1999, there was a Chamoli earthquake, which is not far away from this place. So remember one thing, if we if we go into the, I don't know whether there's a slide or not. If we go into the previous slide, 
and try to understand how this region uh, is. Uh, I don't know whether we have that picture with me or not, uh, but it is a big picture. I, we can say, uh, so all those things, you know, I don't know, uh, all those things, if you say, it is just adjacent to that was the epicenter of Chamoli earthquake. Um, there is a, uh, this is a region over here. You are, so within a 10, 15 kilometers of aerial distance, you have a lot of activities are taking place. You have a consistent construction of the hydropower plant. Remember, this is Rishiganga hydropower plant is somewhere here, which is not far off from this in the 10, 15 kilometers. You have epicenter of Chamalo earthquake, which is from Trishul side. If you go, it is very close by. It, it, the stream moves like this, and it is very close to Trishul Peak. And you have another hydropower plant, which is a rainy hydropower plant. It is nearby here. So it is really within the 10 to 15 kilometers, we have huge amount of construction activities we have done. So what impact? it will have on fragile cryosphere needs to be very clearly understood and studied. So it is unfair to say as of now that there are no, um, uh, no human involvement in this tragedy, as well as it is unfair to say that it is caused because of the human interference. We definitely need the more data and more study to come to the conclusion. But one thing is obviously clear that if we are, had not been there, that if we are not constructed on those dams, as that water would have flown downstream and influence would have reduced. So the significant loss to the human property and life would not have taken place if, if we are not very close to cryosphere. And uh, if uh, whether this tragedy would have taken place or not, had there been no climate change, we don't know. I think jury is still out of that. With this particular thoughts, um, I would like to thank you all, and uh, maybe I can take some questions.